to treat a human being, you have to look at each strand equally. And I was like, wow, what is this? They said, you look at the physical body, you look at the, the mental state of the person, and you look at the spiritual state of the person. Because if any one of these three things are out of alignment, then you have dis-ease. Welcome to Lived In by Zoe Therapy Services. I'm your host, Micah Fay, and I'm excited to share with you a community of experts who specialize in helping you feel fantastic. That's what Lived In aims to be, an online hub for DIY wellness led by the experts and curated by folks who care. In this wellness series, I interview Richmond community leaders, vendors, and healers to empower you with a toolkit. One filled with healthy practices to make every day just a little bit better. So welcome to Lived In, your online comfy couch surrounded by friends and supported by experts. Come on in. We're excited to have you. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Lived In. Today, we are here with Jamie McLaughlin, who is a doctor of oriental medicine. And today, he's going to tell us a little more about that, yeah? Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. cool. Well, I think the first thing I want to know, um, as a total outsider to this, is could you just tell me about your practice mm -hmm. as though I were a fifth grader? Sure, sure. So my background, I actually start off in science. Okay. So I, I come from a, a little different, unique background perspective than some DOMs. Okay. Um, so what I like to think is a little bit unique about my practice is that I sort of integrate science, Western medicine, as well as energy medicine and holistic mindsets of medicine. So my, my practice is sort of fun because we see literally everything. You know, we see people that just come in with physical and physiological problems with already, you know, some type of sort of diagnosis. We treat people from, you know, all walks of life, all ages, babies, all the way to 90 year olds. Um, people from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, which always makes it sort of interesting because yeah. I believe that even those impact our, our, our health, especially yeah, mental certainly. health. So, um, you know, it's really fun. There's always something new and different coming in. Yeah. Um, I try to work with people who are frustrated with their current medical situation. Yeah. A lot of times they've already, especially working here in the West, um, it's, it's sort of different than practicing in the East. I've actually practiced in, in hospitals in China as well. They're okay. usually much more integrated in what they're doing mm -hmm. because of their indigenous medicines and then Western medicine coming in versus the other way around. Um, so my practice is sort of unique in that we do treat things from a Western standpoint, but at okay. the same time, what I'm usually trying to do is bridge that gap and use more complementary medicine practices, getting people to look at the psychological aspects of some of their symptoms and presentations, not just look, looking at the symptoms, but trying to get to more the the root cause of where these things might be coming from and what that message is. Um, I think a symptom is oftentimes um, a sacred messenger. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just that the body is failing us or doing something wrong. It's actually sending us a message that we need to take a deeper look at some of the things that we're doing, some of the actions we're taking, maybe some of the relationships that we're in. Um, so it's really beautiful because I, I get to work with people from a, an emotional, mental, and spiritual aspect, as well as just looking at their physical presentations, but sometimes giving them a different perspective of what their body is trying to communicate mm -hmm. instead of just throwing medications at something to, to really look at maybe their history a little bit differently, the imprints and maybe some of the, um, the other things that are going on that somehow deep down they know, but they're not realizing that it's having a, a physiological impact on their body. Mm. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. I get really um, involved with my patients. Yeah. We develop a, a really neat relationship because I really have to know them, know their story, know their history uh, in order to bring them to that level of true healing. You know, yeah, Heal it sounds like you really talk with your people. I do. Listen yes. a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah. Ask a lot of questions about all different aspects of their lives. Yeah. Unlike most doctors. Yeah, right? which is typically what I hear. Like they are surprised how much time I spend to them and some with them and some of the questions that I actually end up asking. Like no one's ever asked me that before. I never even thought about that before. Right. You know, I have them fill out a very thorough five-page history 
wow. asking all the way from you know what it was like when even in their home environment when they were young, um, what their actual actual their personal birth was like. You know, even that can be traumatic, and there can be imprints on the body from from a prenatal and and you know, neonatal um, aspect that people have never really thought about. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's extensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So then I have about a thousand questions after all of that. <laughs> um, I think my first one is when does a person know that you're the person to go see? Like let's say I'm ready to go see you, but how mm -hmm. would I know that I'm mm -hmm. ready to go see you? So uh, most of my practice, I've been doing this for 22 years, five years here in Virginia and 18 years um, out in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh. Um, so most of my practice is now and for many years has been all word of mouth. I don't really advertise. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't go out and seek business. I let people find me and usually they do that through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, most people are coming to me because they've heard something about me through someone they trust, mm -hmm. family member, coworker, etc. Right. But but most people know that they want to seek me out or seek my, my services out when they have had chronic ailments that just they've tried other things, nothing's really served them or served them served them well. Right. Um, maybe something worked for a short time, but then presentation started coming back. Um, so mm -hmm. typically, I, I see a lot of a lot of folks that have just chronic uh, conditions that nothing else has yet seemed to to help okay. with. So they're coming looking for some some new innovative uh, solutions. Yeah. So those are mental and physical, or are they lar largely physical? Both. Both. Um, both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then that word doctor is in your, your title. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, firstly. What does it mean to be a doctor of oriental medicine for mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, what's the training like? How do, how do you become a doctor of mm -hmm. oriental medicine? Mm -hmm. So there are different schools throughout U the USA. Okay. There's obviously schools in, in you know, other countries, but in the, in the USA, it's a little unique. Uh, there are master's level programs. There are now, especially here on the East Coast, there are, um, pra there are, there are uh, schools, some are accredited, some aren't. So the first thing I would say is if you're going to venture into this, make sure you're actually going to an accredited institution. Otherwise, you'll get all the information, but you won't be able to actually have an actual practice. You won't be able to obtain a license to practice. Okay. Um, so there's uh, an organization called the NCCAOM, and that's what you would actually want to make sure that they are certified through because that's where you take your national exams. Okay. You can go through a quicker program and just become an acupuncturist, mm -hmm. um, or you can do a, a four, anywhere from four to eight year program depending on how the, the, it's set up. Um, it's just like Western medicine. You do uh, both Eastern and Western classes, though. You, mm -hmm. it, with, the, with a larger program to become a doctor of oriental medicine, you have to study the herbal aspect. As, so you do herbal and plant medicines, wow. and that's two to three years of study, um, pretty intensive. Uh, and, and then you have to take a, spe a separate national exam to become an, a nationally recognized herbalist in order to prescribe right. the herbs and use that as the practice. Um, the acupuncture and body work is a separate thing, but, if, but the schools that I recommend, is just, you go for the whole entire thing. Because to really understand all the theories and principles and practices, you want to understand that oriental medicine, there's different branches of it. Even in China, yeah. you've got your acupuncturist, and they're sort of the specialist, and they just do acupuncture. You've got the Tui Na doctors, which is basically like chiropractic over there. Mm -hmm. So it's like soft tissue manipulation. They used to be called bone setters, right? But it's, it's through, it's manual manipulation physical therapy. They don't have physical therapy and chiropractic over there. It's all sort of in, 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 in one branch called Tuina. And so you're basically an energy, energy medicine body worker. Um, but it's, it's really fun. It's a, it's a lot of hands-on uh, work. We, I do that mostly with my, my children patients. I don't acupuncture babies much hmm. unless there's a really serious condition. It's, more, it's mostly just doing body work and type of uh, physiotherapy. It's yeah. called Tuina. And then the other branch of Chinese medicine is the herbal medicine. To me, that's the most challenging part. It's it's pretty extensive because you're learning learning pharmacology, but you're learning plants, right. you know, and how to formulate plants. Different than a Western herbalist, in that most Western herbalists, although wonderfully trained, they usually are looking at individual plants uh, as far to use as as for medicinal purposes yeah. and the extracts and compounds of those individual plants versus learning formulations. And the difference, so the difference there is Chinese medicine really works with formulations because they believe there's a synergy with the plants and an energy that 
it takes you know six to eight different things to work um, with with the entire body. So there'll be a main herb, a guide herb, and then herbs to to remedy the the negative side effects of that, so you don't get toxic. You know, right. uh, yeah. And then also what we call guide herbs, meaning those herbs that will actually drive the formula or the main medicine to the area of the body that you're wanting to focus on. So it's pretty extensive. Yeah. It's it's yeah. yeah it's like pharmacology, but but a little bit more involved. But it's beautiful because you're studying the energy of the plant. Right and the properties of the plants as well. Um, and so when you're looking at, again, holistic medicine, uh, just like we are uh, we're not mechanistic, we're the sum of many parts, so are plants. Yeah. And one plant may have 20 different medicines in it because there's different compounds in different parts of the plant. The flower may do something totally different than the root, than, right, the, than yeah. the stem, than the branch, right? So it's really fun to learn all of that, but you've got to really love botany. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Um, and then the other aspect of Chinese medicine that people often don't even realize is a branch of Chinese medicine is Qigong. And Qigong literally means breath work. Mm -hmm. Qi means breath. Literal translation in Mandarin is breath. And Gong means work. It's breath work. And that is a huge part of the medicine that a lot of people don't learn. And it's, it's really very profound. Yeah. Yeah. In theater school, you actually, the first thing you learn is that only actors ever truly know how to breathe. Mm -hmm. and oh, very spend, few people really know how to breathe. They're exchanging yeah, air, but they're not truly, truly breathing. breathing. And there's different ways of teaching people to breathe that will yeah. actually change the chemistry in the body, the brain, the digestion, the heart rate. Okay. So yeah. it's really a beautiful aspect of the medicine that most people don't take the time to learn. Yeah. So being a doctor of oral medicine, you actually study a little bit of all four of those branches. And then you take, take take an actual test. It's basically like having a PhD, although they don't call it that. Just like a, a doctor of chiropractic is a DC. Right. And a doctor of veterinary medicine is DVM. So DOM is doctor of oriental medicine. Just means you've had a little bit more mm. education and you've studied all, all the branches equally. So then let's talk about your branches. Mm -hmm. Which ones do you specialize in? I know you said sort of manual manipulation mm -hmm. and as well as acupuncture, I mm -hmm. believe. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little more about those specialties. That you know, have, the, the true essence of the medicine is in the herbs, but I find in the West with big pharma and the way people are, are taught here, it's really a challenge to get people to comply mm -hmm. and to be open-minded to the the herbal medicines. Interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of stigma around er, about herbs and plants, and, and there's a lot of products, supplements, and different things, and people yeah. add, you know administering them in different ways. So. That to me in the West is probably the most challenging part to implement and get people to, to do. Um, although I do think it's the essence of the medicine if you can get people on board and get them okay. compliant and get them again. And then you've got these herb drug interactions. So many Westerners are on you know, medications. Right. Right. And you've gotta be really careful with that because they are medicines. So you may get some things that might not be, um, they may not jive. So you've gotta know your herb drug interactions as well. And you gotta stay up on that because new drugs are coming out all the time. Right. So it's, that's the biggest challenge, but also I think the essence of it right there. Um, most people come to me for the acupuncture here in Richmond okay. uh, because that's what you know everybody's reading about, talking about, right? So, and you know, people come to me and it's like you have to listen to what they're asking for. You know, if people come to me and they want to try acupuncture and I try to put them on an herb, they're not going to be very happy with me. <laughs> yeah. So first to be present and listen to what your client is asking for and try to work with them. And then slowly I get them to uh, trust me build rapport, yeah. and then I'll get them sometimes to try some of the other things that they might not be open to at first. But I'd say most of my clients come in wanting, wanting me for acupuncture. That's kind of what I'm known for. Defense, in terms of the, it was, the it was. Of the consumer Very and... much so, because I worked with a lot of indigenous peoples there. I worked with a lot of Native Americans and Hispanics, and they actually don't want to take pharmaceutical drugs. Right. They would prefer to come for the herbal medicines and the plant-based medicines because that's what they resonate with and that's what they believe in still. Um, so I, I practice a lot more herbal medicine in New Mexico than I, I, did, I do here. Yeah. Uh, but I still love the acupuncture and I do get great results with it, but I again have to explain to people it is cumulative. It's not a one-time fix, especially yeah. for really chronic conditions. Yeah. And I think a lot of Westerners want that, you know, they, they want that, I want results and I want them now, especially yeah. if insurance isn't paying for it, they're paying out of yes. pocket, you know. So a lot of that comes down to patient education. You know, it's like, yes, we can fix this with energy work and body work and acupuncture, but you have to be realistic and realize this is going to be a process, right. you know. Mm -hmm. right. You're going to get faster results if you'll take some of the herbals and something you can you know, administer daily right. to yourself. 
I'm but, curious though, I, you would think that a person who trusts acupuncture would also trust plants. Yeah. You know, I think they, I'd they, have more trouble do. with the acupuncture they part. Do. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, yeah. They, they do, but, the, but the, it just, it's, especially here in, in Virginia, it's still pretty conservative here, yeah. you know. And a lot of people are coming, um, you know, from a, a standpoint of, well, that hasn't been tested, and they've been told by their physicians yeah. that's not FDA regulated, and so they're coming with this fear, you know, yeah. behind it. So some of it just takes time, rapport, and and just gaining their trust really yeah. before they'll they'll listen. Then I have patients that I have, it's like, wow, they trust me so much. If I told them to jump off a bridge, they would go do it. So then, you know, so then those people, it's like, well. You know, you got to be really careful, and that's where ethics comes in because right. you tell them to try this, try this, and they'll just do anything because they love you, they trust you, you get, you know, they, they they've trusted your hands, and so now they'll trust anything you say. Right. And and not everyone, you know, not everyone needs herbs, just like not everyone needs medication. Some people that would come in and want to try an herbal supplement or say, what can I take for A, B, or C? And I'm like, actually, that would be best treated with an acupuncture treatment. So yeah. you get you get it from both both sides. But here in Richmond, I'm kind of known for being an acupuncturist. That's that's, that's that's sort of the, the big thing. Okay. I did teach Qigong for a while at West. I taught it here for a while, and then my practice got so busy I had to kind of let it go. Uh -huh. But that is one thing as I get older and um, kind of want to do things to help larger groups of people, that is something that I'm kind of starting to do more and more is, is teaching the Qigong and the breath work because I find right now, especially with this pandemic and all the anxiety and fear, and people are, are really needing some self-care tools and to teach people different breathing methods that they can do on their own that doesn't cost anything. It's really a, a good service to provide okay. and, and a real gift to give to the community too. Are you going to be doing that online? Offering I'm actually, online? I'm putting some stuff together now. Um, my, my, my wife, we were just talking before we started, she's actually a breathwork facilitator from California. So she and I are going to be doing some th more things together. We were starting to do a lot right before COVID hit with the community, but now we're like, put, put the brakes on. So we're going to start doing more things, um, you know, through Zoom and through, through, through teachings. Yeah, okay. You and your wife should definitely check out theater schools because I concentrated in voice mm -hmm. and vocal manipulation, mm -hmm. um, like specifically within dialects. Um, and so for me, we, I spent the first six months in corpse pose on the ground, mm. not being allowed to do anything but breathe. Mm. We weren't allowed to talk. We weren't, weren't allowed to have what, what they call black breath or mm. breath with any sound, mm. not even gray breath, no mm. like hisses. Mm -hmm. um, and it was six months of literally laying on the ground uh, and breathing and being taught how to breathe mm. for six months. And then oh. I paid what, $8,000 for that class? <laughs> Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but it's, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's truly life altering mm -hmm. to know how to manipulate your breath yeah. and how to live within its truth. Or I guess that's how we talk about it. It's true. We talk yeah. about it as the only truth that it's, an actor it, has it, is their breath. You know, it is so profound. You think about it. It's the first thing we do that tells us we're alive, right? right? It's spiritual. Yeah. Right? It is. It it's is. the spirit. It is the spirit. It truly is. And it's the last thing we do before we leave. And it's the one thing we can't live very long without. We right. can live without water for a few days and food for months and various things, but we cannot live without the, the breath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then... I guess in reflecting on Richmond, I'm curious your experience in China. Where were you and sort of what was that like mm -hmm. and uh, how much do you miss it? <laughs> yes, I've been to China three different times. Okay. Uh, the longest stint that I spent there was working at a stroke hospital uh, at Heilingjiang University, which is way up in Harbin, China, okay. on the Russian border. It's quite cold up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, used Qigong a lot just to breathe because it was so cold. You got to keep your body temperature regulated. Uh, so, but that was really a fascinating um, journey. I actually was, that, that was something I, um, I actually applied for. I didn't think mm -hmm. I had a shot in the world to get it. And then I ended up getting selected. Wow. And so I was like, wow, now I got selected. I guess I have to really do it, you know? So, yeah. so I went for about six months and just studied um, neuroacupuncture. So it's different protocols than we learn in traditional school with the acupuncture. And I worked right along um, people that were sort of like physical therapists and speech therapists. We were all working together. Believe it or not, there are speech and motor lines on the, on the scalp that you needle just subdermally, and we would hook that up to electricity. So there, we learned a lot of really unique um, protocols for treating stroke patients. Wow. And with that um, 
I also had an opportunity to work in a ward where I was working mostly with spinal cord injuries. Mm -hmm. I saw some miraculous things happen there that by our standards in the West, we would think were miracles, but there they were doing this every day. I saw people come in with massive strokes that if they had had that same stroke in the U.S. and been treated the way we typically treat post-stroke, they would have had, you know, permanent disabilities for life. And I literally saw people come in and within 30 to 40 days leave that hospital, going right back to their lives, right back to work like they'd never had a stroke. So I know these therapies can be done, but we don't have anything like that in the West. So it was really, I know. It's so frustrating mm -hmm. to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think would have to change here for that to be more possible? Well, we'd have to remove ego. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. First and foremost, we, right? Yes. At first, we'd have to remove all the ego, and we'd have to bend our minds around the benefits and the limitations of science. Mm -hmm. You know, here we're so science-minded. If it's not provable and predictable and objectifiable and quantifiable, then it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not real. It doesn't fit into our paradigm. And they're, they're using very little science. They're using energy medicine, meridians. Um, they're basically using the activation of electrical impulses to basically reactivate the neurons. You know, here we, we're told, we're even taught in, in school when we study science that, that neurons don't regenerate. It's the one cell in the body that doesn't regenerate. And there, they don't believe that's true. Mm. They believe that basically neurons um, simply lose the ability to communicate with one another when there's a stroke. Mm. And so if we get, as soon as the bleeding is arrested in the brain, they do use CT scans and certain medications, pharmaceutical medications to arrest the bleeding. Yeah. But as soon as the bleeding is arrested, then they go in and they immediately start with electro stimulation on meridians and acupuncture points and getting people to, um, you know, just start reusing limbs and swallowing in speech. So they're using some of the traditional therapies, but they're using it all with the lead of oriental medicine principles. So, yeah. so it's really fascinating. They're using the Western medicine for the acute catastrophic event. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then as soon as that event, is, it's, but the body is safe, there's no longer a, a, a true threat of, of death, yeah. Yeah. then it, immediately the Eastern medicine therapists are coming in and taking over. And, f and they receive three acupuncture treatments a day for an hour long. So three hours, you know, basically right before breakfast, right before lunch, right before dinner, you're getting an hour long high stimulated, um, you know, acupuncture treatment. But while the needles are in and while the electricity is going off in these different pulses and different frequencies, they're having the physical therapist do the stretching to re-educate, mm -hmm. to basically get the neurons to communicate again mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Wow. And the problem that we have here in the West is we wait, we do, we do physical therapy, we do speech therapy, but we wait too long. As soon as the bleeding is arrested, it has to start then. Yeah. If we wait days, weeks, months, here I see people wait years before they come in for a different type of you know, alternative care treatment. And by that time, it's like the neurons are still there, but they've just sort of gotten so lazy, it's really difficult to get, to get them to get excited again and to communicate again. Yeah, I talk to people all the time when they come to me like stroke patients and they've had 15 years since their stroke and mm -hmm. can I help them? And I said, you know, being realistic, I could probably help with some of the spasticity and some of the atrophy, but as far as getting the neurons to completely refire, to recommunicate again, it's sort of like this. It's like having a battle with, your, with, a, with a close family member at a Christmas party and you both are very set in your ways and you just refuse to, to, to agree. <laughs> And you go away angry and you refuse to speak for years and years and years. The longer that relationship goes without trying to make amends and communicate, the less likely it is you're probably ever going to know each other as well again, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just like that's what happens with the neurons, right? Yeah. So as soon as that spat happens, we need to start communicating, forgive, continue the relationship. Um, and because the longer we let it go, it's like they're both fine, the neurons are fine, but they refuse to make an agreement to, to come together and communicate, and therefore you lose permanent activation. Wow. You know? Yeah. But what's really beautiful is I truly saw people that had massive strokes come in, and again, they're not allowed to leave the hospital. It's every day for 30 to 40 days until they reach full medical capacity, but most of them would walk out of that hospital. You could never even tell they'd had a stroke, and it was within you know, less than two months of the stroke of the event.
Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I'm curious, after all of that experience, what what do you say to the skeptics? Even people who aren't skeptical of, mm -hmm. of the kind of work you're doing, but mm -hmm. like, I don't want a bunch of little needles in me. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you do, what do you do about that? How sure. do you talk to them? You know, I just treat everyone with compassion and respect, and it's not my job to sell them on something. Mm -hmm. It's just my job to provide a, a caring service. Mm -hmm. And I know I, there's billions of people in the world, I, po I can't possibly help them all, yeah. and nothing is for everyone. Yeah. And, and you know, our minds are so powerful. If you are dead set against something working for you, mm. then it's probably not your medicine, right? right. Because if you um, aren't going to accept it as something that could, that could benefit you, you know, all the attempts in the world, you know, may or may not help you. Um, people come to me all the time, isn't it a placebo effect? Isn't it a placebo effect? And I said, well, I don't think so, because I've seen so many miraculous things happen in my years of practice that even I sometimes am taken back at how amazing this medicine can be. Um, and you know, we work with animals with it, we work with children with it, right. and they're not judging it. They don't have a preconceived notion of what's happening or any, any predetermined outcome, um, yet they get better. And they actually get better faster. And I think part of that is because they're not judging it. They're not caught up in their mind about it. You know, they're not in their monkey brain trying to figure it out, <laughs> right? They just allow it and therefore their bodies recover much faster. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's in incredible. So mm -hmm. then I'm curious about your journey because I don't think a person wakes up and says, I'm gonna be a doctor of oriental medicine, you right. know? So how, yeah. where did you start? Presumably mm -hmm. you were born in the West. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so what, what was your personal journey to this practice? Yeah, so I was actually born in the Midwest to a very Catholic, very conservative family that even thought chiropractic was complete quackery. So this definitely wasn't something that I grew up thinking about at all. Right. Um, I actually knew I wanted to help people. I knew I wanted to serve in, and I love science and I loved, I was always curious about life and the body and what makes things work and what makes things start to decay, degenerate. At what point does that shift, right? Um, even watching plants and flowers, it's like, what, what, what is behind the whole thing of yeah. life, right? And, and so I got really curious about that first. And so I knew I wanted to do something, and I loved people. I've always loved people. Even when I want to smack them, I still love them. Right? <laughs> um, and so I knew I wanted to serve. I knew I wanted to serve humankind. And, and I knew that I was so fascinated with life. And, and, but, I, but I also knew... So I started becoming an MD. I took the measures to, to, to do that. I, so I got two degrees in science. I was going to go to traditional Western medical school. But even then, um, I always felt like no matter how, I loved microbiology. I loved, I loved studying the cells. I loved biology. Um, but but I, I always felt like for me, something was missing. You know, it was fascinating. There was tons to learn. There was, uh, there was a lot that was truthful, but there was also something inside of me that kept saying, there's still something missing, yeah. you know? And um, I was discussing this with some friends of mine before I committed to medical school because I knew it was going to be a lot of money and a big commitment. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, I thought about physical therapy. I thought about chiropractic, but nothing quite seemed to align. I just, you know, I just was just trusting myself. I was speaking to some people one weekend and someone said, why don't you look into like Eastern medicine or acupuncture or naturopathic medicine? It seems to be kind of like more, more philosophically aligned with you. And I thought, yeah. wow, never thought about that avenue, really. Always thought acupuncture would be kind of cool, but never really thought about doing it for a living. So long story short, I ended up not taking my seat at KU Med which my parents thought I'd lost my mind, especially my dad. He thought I'd totally lost my mind. Yeah. And at the time, when I was just finishing college, I had a really good friend, um, Yoko Takai. She was from Japan. She was a foreign exchange student. Mm -hmm. And she had an uncle that was an acupuncturist in Japan. And she was like, she was a very dear friend of mine. I was really just soul searching at the time. And she was like, why don't I make some connections with my uncle and see if you could just go there for maybe three months, maybe six months. At this time, I'd never been on an airplane. I'd never flown. Wow. Never been anywhere, you know. And um, I was like, you know, that sounds really cool. If nothing else, it would buy me some time. Yeah. And then maybe a year from now, I can come back and go to med school. But at least I'll know it's, it's right for me. I'll have, I just need some time. So I went there. And honestly, that's where everything changed for me. Mm. Everything changed. Wow. You know, I had been raised Roman Catholic. I'd gone to parochial schools, even college. It, it was a Catholic school. Wow. Um, 
over there, I just I started looking into like they study Shintoism, which is belief of, of you know, basically God in nature. And they honor all living things, the consciousness of, of nature. And I thought, oh, my gosh, yeah, that that aligns that there's something truthful in that for me. You know, all these little voids, all those little things that I thought were missing. It's it's in this understanding and this philosophy. And it's not like I switched religions or beliefs. It was just, it expanded my, my beliefs. Yeah. And it made me realize that, you know, there, that's what's missing is there's a consciousness. There's a spirituality that, that science doesn't address. Yeah. You know, we have, we have psychology, and I always liked psychology. I took a lot of psychology courses, in fact, more than I even needed to because I was just so interested in, you know, it, when I grew up, it was the separation of the mind and the body. You know, it was like we have the body and we have the mind, you know, and I was like, no, 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 that's all wrong, you know, because I know when I have a specific thought or when I get upset, I feel the physiological shifts in my body. So I know what I'm thinking and what I'm hearing and the environment that I'm in is having a physiological effect on my body, but we can't scientifically prove exactly how. And when I went over to Japan, one of the first things I was shown when I started shadowing them in their office was how... We treat the whole person. They said the, 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 the spirit of our medicine is that it's, it, they said it's, it's a braid. It's a braid of three strands. And to treat a human being, you have to look at each strand equally. And I was like, wow, what is this? They said, you look at the physical body, you look at the, the mental state of the person, and you look at the spiritual state of the person. Because if any one of these three things are out of alignment, yeah. then you have dis-ease disease which will lead to disease if not addressed and i was like oh my gosh and i just started getting so excited because for the first time i was like wow this is what my spirit has been telling me all along it, it's that void yeah. it's what's missing in the way we practice medicine in the west yes it's not just looking at the physical symptoms and the physiological presentations and the measurements that we take mm -hmm. right things within certain limits mm -hmm. but it's looking at what is your spiritual purpose for being here? Mm -hmm. Are you in alignment with that in your life? Mm -hmm. Because if not, the spirit's gonna start knocking. And what's carrying the spirit around is this form, this vessel, this body. Yeah. So if we're not in alignment with our spiritual selves, who we really are and why we're really here, if we're just doing t t this with all the distractions in life, and at some point, if we don't get in alignment with our spiritual purpose, Spirit's going to start creating some rumble in the body. Mm -hmm. And we can actually look at symptoms. We can look at presentations, especially when they're chronic. And we can actually start to see what's happening. What is the message in that body? There's something in Chinese medicine called five element theory. And I learned that early on and I just fell in love with it. And I practice it every day. And what it is, is it says there's a, an emotion a specific emotion that will become out of alignment when a particular organ is out of alignment or vice versa. Okay. So if you have an anger issue, and anger can be frustration, it can be resentment, it can be jealousy, something that's been imprinted or some type of trauma that we've held on to from an experience. Could be a long time ago, could be recent. That we don't know, but we do know that, that those emotions that rise up in us and affect the body as though we're angry. And, and again, in the West, we think angry is something we want to avoid. It's a negative emotion. And in Chinese medicine, it's like there are no negative or positives. It's just a human emotion. Yeah. But if it gets out of alignment, if it is stored for too long in the body and not expressed and realized, it will start creating problems in the digestive system and more specifically in the liver. Yeah, and then goes on and on. Fear, same thing. Fear, something that we coin as negative. Not negative, it's just a human emotion. It helps us survive. Mm -hmm. But if we live in fear and we don't admit it, we don't express it, we don't realize it and see what the message is in it, if we harbor it, if we contain it, if we allow it to imprint us and we hold it, it will start damaging the urinary system, specifically the kidneys. Wow. Yeah. And then there's a presentation with the inward systems and the out systems. So the liver actually has a specific meridian tied to it. So if people are having chronic pain along that meridian, it will usually end up being groin pain, sometimes hernias, mm -hmm. medial knee pain, 
medial ankle pain, pain in the toe, right? And so when people start having these chronic ailments and it's like, you know, I had the MRI, I had the CT scan, I've gone to the orthopedic doctor, I've gone, you know, we've ran all these tests, nothing's wrong with me. Yeah. Most of these patients are either told they're depressed, put on antidepressant, sent to a therapist for some talk therapy, which sometimes helps because sometimes they at least realize there's something going on that's an emotion. But Western doctors are quick to poo-poo that, you know, this could be, this is liver meridian. The liver function is fine. Well, for now it's fine. But I, I, I look at energy medicine and this five element theory with the emotional stuff. I look at it as though it's like the yellow light it starts giving us a signal and information. And if we don't pay heed to it over time, it will become what we call red light. And that's when intervention medicine, Western medicine does have to come in because then you do have, you know, liver enzyme issues or need a liver replacement. I'm seeing more and more people now here in the West that have fatty livers and liver, liver problems, mm -hmm. true liver physiological problems, but they're not alcoholics, mm -hmm. you know. Um, a lot of times our doctors will prejudge them and say, oh, you must be an alcoholic, you're just not admitting it because your liver enzymes are off the charts and you're not, you say you're not taking, you know, ibuprofen, you say you're not taking those other things, but you must be, so you must be an alcoholic. And they'll come to me and it's like, oh, but I'm not an alcoholic. I don't know why my liver is so upset. And I'm like, well, let's go back and look at the emotional history of your life. Yeah. Have you had a lot of resentment? You know, do you, are you short fused? Are you irritable? Are you frustrated? You've been frustrated for a long time. I see this a lot with female patients because yeah. they're told socially that it's not okay for them to express anger. They're supposed yeah. to be good. They're supposed to be ladylike. And so they, they really harbor the emotion and don't express it. So you see a lot of them that start having these presentations. Mm -hmm. So with every emotion, there's an organ system and a body that reflects some of the imbalances that could be rising up from a harbored emotion. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's what I learned in, in Japan. And I decided right then and there, I was like, I love this so much that even if I go back and study more Western medicine, I'm going to bring this into it because I believe there's so much truth. I don't need scientific proof that this is real. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be able to measure this and, and predict it and have some you know, fancy research around it. I just, I just know that this embodies some truth and I know we could use this information. You know? But what happened is the more I studied it, the more I knew, the more it philosophically resonated with me. And the more I fell in love with it. So by the time I left Japan, I decided I was just going to go to Eastern Medical School and I'm not going to study science anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's my, that was my journey with it. I really didn't think I'd practice it for a living. Right. Um, but when I, once I learned more and more about it, it just felt like that this was the best way for me to serve was to bring these principles to the West and, and at least be an option for people who are frustrated with traditional, you know, methods that aren't getting help because there's some other ways there's different perspectives of how we can look at what is presenting in your body and it may or may not be the case but oftentimes it's exactly what's missing because mm -hmm. most of my patients have already gone the western route mm -hmm. they've already tried everything and if something is still not working then we've got to look at what is the spiritual and energetic message that could be trying to surface and once we get it once we bring it to a conscious awareness they heal quickly that's what's so cool about it. Wow. Yeah. It's like a little kid going, mama, 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 mama. They mm -hmm. just keep nagging at you until you ask, yeah, you pay attention. What do you want? And once that communication is there, the symptoms go away. Huh. Yeah. So then my favorite question that we get to ask um, here at Zoe, we believe not only in mind, body, and spirit, which are mm -hmm. our central tenets, but also yeah. the fourth community. Yeah. And that's my favorite one. Um, and I know you've talked over and over again about your call to serve. Mm. So I'm curious, from your specialized knowledge, what can we take to serve our neighbors, mm -hmm. both metaphorical and actual, mm -hmm. better? Mm -hmm. What can we learn from you today that we can take to become better community members? Yeah, and you know, this is a bigger thing that I've seen this past year with COVID, mm -hmm. the pandemic. Um, you know, what we really need is more, um, more of a sense of community mm -hmm. and less um, isolation. Mm -hmm. We Westerners tend to be more isolated than I think is healthy. I've traveled a lot and I see all these, you know, community-centered, community-based um, peoples and they may not have as much as we have by our standards but in some ways they have more because they have a sense of extended family and community mm -hmm. um, what I would would want 
for people to, to take from this is even though we have to follow certain protocols and you know that obviously there's there are certain things that we have to do certain parameters we have to follow however don't lose your connection to your community to your tribe i personally i've studied a lot of indigenous medicines now not just chinese medicine and what i see that aligns with all indigenous peoples is a sense of ceremony mm -hmm. And it seems like when Westerners, you know, Europeans came and took over this land, we, we took away a lot of the ceremony, mm. you know. We colonized and we made ceremony more of a religion, right? Yeah. And I'm certainly not against religion and religious you know, gatherings. That's good. Have a sense of community. Have a sense of support. But in addition to that, create ceremony in your lives. Mm -hmm. Bring the ceremony back because we all at some point have some indigenous ancestry in our DNA, and I think we're missing the ceremonies. Mm. Whether it's a drum circle or a meditation circle or a group, small group of people doing yoga, even if you for a while have to do it through Zoom, connect with like-minded people. Mm. Don't allow this polarization that's happening to continue to happen. Stop seeing the differences in people and see the commonalities and, and reconnect with your tribe. Okay. And if you don't have a tribe, get a tribe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah, I love the idea of creating the rituals even around mm -hmm. dinner or yeah. meals mm -hmm. that we used to, mm -hmm. you know, sit around the table. Mm -hmm. Somebody would say a blessing. Mm -hmm. You're sitting at the table. The yeah. table has been set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now most people are eating standing up or yeah. on the run or yeah. in the living room watching TV. And yeah. There's no pause or formality to mm -hmm. it, which I think... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To digestion even. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so a way to express yourself spiritually, you know, mm -hmm. through art, through music, through drumming, through chanting, through meditating, through something, you know, yeah. a lot of indigenous peoples have like tea ceremonies, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what I even think is, is really beautiful. You'll feel the energy of a group shift. If you all will just sit in a circle, mm -hmm. just sit in a circle and have your conversation in a circle. Yeah. That's a ceremony. It doesn't have to be anything profound. Um, my, my wife is reading a book right now called uh, The you know, Ceremony, and it's by Sandra, Ig Sandra Ingram, who's from Santa I was just Santa about Fe. to ask you if you had read Ceremony. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about teaching it next yeah, year. Yeah, I think so. it's a great thing. And, and, you know, I can't think of a better time. We need to bring this back in, yeah. into the community. Wow. We've lost our sense of connectedness. We've lost our sense of community, tribe, and ceremony is a beautiful way to bring that back. Mm -hmm. Even if it's three people, four people, five people, it doesn't have to be hundreds and thousands of people, just, just a, a small group of people, but to reconnect again, be authentic, have open heart connection with other people, mm -hmm. and create some type of, of ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're nearing our hour, and I know you have a busy day. So last follow-up final questions. Sure. How do we get in touch with you? How do our viewers find you and come to see you? Mm -hmm. Probably the best way. I'm old fashioned. Just I'll, I'll just put my cell phone number out there. Just Great. text me or call me. I usually respond quicker with text. I do have emails. I do have a website. But honestly, if you really want to get in touch with me, just reach me directly. It's the easiest way. I like to just handle people directly, okay. not through others. Okay. Um, I, that's how I like to run everything. It's a little bit more on me, but that's truly the best way to do it. Do you want to share your texting number sure here? it's 804-389-0267 and you are an, an excellent texter <laughs> I, i'm you pretty on the ball right with the away texting, when yeah. i texted you <laughs> the, the phone is now my extra limb but yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and i guess finally the floor is yours whatever you want to talk about what's next for you what you're excited about in your practice right now mm -hmm. whatever you'd like to say we're here to to listen. You know, I think just on this same theme, theme with community, mm -hmm. I think right now the most important message that I can put out to anyone listening is you are not alone. Yeah. Don't continue just isolating and introverting. It's fine. And being alone is, is not a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. But I think we're really being um, challenged right now with emotional and, and mental health and the best way to, to double down is, is to stay connected with your people. And if you don't have people, there are a beautiful people all around you. Just branch out, reach out, and meet them. Because if you're feeling this way, I guarantee you, there are thousands of other that, people that are too. And I think a strong sense of connection to other people, find a support system, find a group, find a tribe, it's so important. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Really enlightening talk. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you.